Thanks for everyone for being here. It's a nice little town here. I haven't been here before, but like there's, we had a lot of activists out to the outreach today, which was good to see. That's what I get involved in. Um, it's not just about being vegan anymore for me. It's about being active, because that's the only way we can directly help the problem that's at hand. So what I want to do is tell you my story. I think my story inspires a lot of people uh, in a way that, you know, from where I come from to where I'm at now, um, you know, maybe it can give you a little bit of a push to do a little bit more and um, because where I come from, you'd never would have guessed that I, you know, got to where I am today. So I always start off my talk with a story that only come back to me when I turned vegan. Um, and this story is, it's really significant because it sort of highlights the conditioning that we're, we're brought into as, at such a young age. So when I was about five years old, I remember I was playing out the back and it was Christmas morning and my little brother was playing close to these ants and I was like trying to protect the ants. And I said, hey, Josh, get out the way, get out the way. Don't step on the ants because it's Christmas. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to see ants get trodden on, on Christmas morning. Now, something as insignificant as a little insect, like an ant in many people's eyes, I didn't want to see get hurt. And it was interesting that, you know, I was soon conditioned to a violent society that, that said it's okay to eat a piece of a cow who'd been bolt gunned in the head and suffered greatly. So, and then later on, I was conditioned to more violence when I got into the gangs and stuff, which is what I'll get into now. Um, what ended up happening with me is um, I had a sort of, a, it was a normal childhood. Your parents had broken up. You know, there was, that's just the normal, from my part of town where I'm from, n normal divorce and things like that. And so I had a single mother and I was around a little bit of partying. She was a young mother and I was around sort of drinking and parties and stuff. I don't know whether that affected me, but I did know that I was quite a lost youth. I'd had no answers. And at around 13, 12, 13, 14, I started experimenting with using uh, recreational drugs. It started off with marijuana, started off with alcohol. Um, I left school at about 14. I started hanging around some shaved head guys. We thought we were pretty cool and tough and all that stuff. And they, those kids were from either a low income neighborhood they, you know, had parents that had broken up too. They were using drugs as well. We were just, you know, it was more like we had a little brotherhood there and we, we all found solitude in drinking and using drugs. But some people can. And I didn't realise that I had this genetic predisposition to addiction and I was playing with fire. So that's how the gang life started, you know, just a bunch of mates hanging out. The violence progressed from... <laughs> Um, you know, it was just street fights. We'd have street fights to boost our reputation. You know, we, you know, if you do something, you think you're pretty cool, you punch someone in the face one night, or, you know, th this is how it all starts. Just playing with a bit of fire. You know, your, your friends are like egging you on, and that's not vegan, vegan egging you on. And yeah, and you know, you sort of get praise from your social setting for these, these you know, acts of violence and for doing silly things. So I always talk about the environment and how it shapes you. Like you can take, you know, like an innocent sort of compassionate child like I was and put them in a certain environment and it conditions you, it shapes you. Violent environments shape you. And where I come from is either, you know, you learn to adapt or you get swallowed up. So that's what I did. I learned to adapt and, you know, I was, I sort of let go of who I was and you get, you have these two wolves. I talk about the negative wolf and the positive wolf. This is actually an Indian proverb. And the wolf that survives is the one that you feed. And I was feeding the negative wolf and I cultivated this side of me, this violent, aggressive side of me to be able to deal with the environment that I was in. So where it progressed. So, you know, this was just, you know, through my teens, I got older, it sort of gets a little bit more full on. So you get conditioned to more and more violence. It becomes normalised. Um, and you're sort of trying to push the envelope. And that's what happened with me. The gangs got a little bit more, um, a little bit more dangerous. We got older. The violence got serious. It got organised. Um, I started using drugs more. I started dealing drugs. So I was heavily involved with it, and my psychology started to fall victim to it because you can't do that forever with, without, obviously, having some mental health issues. And I was depressed. Had anxiety. Um, I was aggressive. I spent some time in a mental ward. Um, you know, I. That, that world is just so dangerous and there's a lot of paranoia. So you're always looking over, over your shoulder. You're either worried about the police, you're worried about opposing gangs, you're worried about some um, repercussions from some violence you caused on the weekend. And, you know, 
like some serious things happened. Like I've been, I've been bashed, I've been run over, I've been held hostage at gunpoint on my birthday, um, I've been bottled, you know. So the things that I was doing were coming back on me, and that's what, what leads me to this story here. Um, it's a story about a car accident that I had. And I went out this one night, and I already had an attitude. I had an argument with my girlfriend, I had this, you know, this sort of anger overcome me, and I, I put a weapon in my pocket. So I went out with this, this already... I already knew what was going to happen, I, I, so I went out with this attitude, and we got to the, the bar, and there was a, an, another gang outside this bar, and I started a fight that could have been avoided. So what ended up happening is we had a very, a very big brawl. It was a big brawl that was, it was very um, brutal, and people got seriously hurt. What ended up happening is the other guys, they hopped in their car, and they drove past us really quick, boom, and I moved out of the way. Okay, I had two mates with me, and we started walking back to our car. And what ended up happening is they did, they circled around, I didn't, we didn't know. They circled back around and come back through the same car park. And they come firing through really fast. And I mean, I didn't even have time. I didn't even have time. So what I did is I just jumped up, and my friends went on like either side of me, and I jumped up with the car, and I, and I was up in the air. So when I got hit and I was up in the air, it was like my whole life had flashed before my eyes. I don't know if anyone's had a near-death experience, but it was like... I seen every moment leading up to there. I was like, well, I caused this. I come out with this attitude. I had dust, knuckle dusters in my pocket. I wanted a fight. I got what I asked for. And this was my attitude. I knew I, I got what I'd asked for on that night. I thought I was dead. I literally thought I was dead. In the air, roof height. Friends were freaking out. Boom, I hit the ground. Blood coming out my head. Okay, I survived. Obviously, I'm here. But this was one of the first moments I realized that our actions, like what we do, has a reaction. Because I'd, I'd seen it in that criminal world. I'd seen what was happening. People were going out doing bad things and it was happening back to them. And this was a significant moment for me because I, I understood that, you know, the action-reaction thing. And it, it was a defining moment for me in many ways. But I didn't learn my lesson then. I didn't learn my lesson then. It took me many mistakes for me to make serious mistakes, life-threatening mistakes for me to learn my lesson. So... Um, where it'll come to a head, where it'll come to a head. I want to talk a little bit about suicide for, um, as well because obviously going through all these mental issues, you, you know, you get trapped in the corner, you cause all these issues, you've got issues yourself, you've got anxiety, you can't deal with it. And I remember sitting on the end of my girlfriend's bed one day and I was just like, there's no way out. Like I've caused all this stuff for myself and there's no way out. I had these, these demons, they, they wouldn't let me go like I was, and the environment I was in. And I hated myself and I couldn't escape. And I remember I had a gun because I would always carried a gun because of the environment I was in. And I stuck it in my mouth and I thought this is the only way out. But suicide doesn't um, make things get better. It just ends, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it just ends the chances of anything getting better. You know, it's just, if I pulled the trigger back then, I wouldn't have another chance, this chance to share my story and to help other people and to help animals. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't pull that trigger, but... A lot of people, you know, a lot of people do. Suicide's a serious problem with, you know, young males and females as well. So, but where it all come to a head was when I got busted. Okay, so the way I got busted was I was on this rampage. I was just like, you know, on drugs, running around, causing trouble for everyone, and myself and my family were distressed. And so I was running around with a gun down my pants. I was on the run from the police, and they found me at out the front of a hotel room. Um, a girl had locked her keys in the car that I was with and she was trying to get her keys out of the car. Anyway, the police got us and found the gun down my pants and I got arrested, I went to jail. First uh, experience with prison. So my grandfather had just died. So my, my mother was mourning the death of her, grand, uh, her father and my grandfather and um, I was in a prison cell and I was in um, maximum security punishment unit where you know, they put all the punished prisoners, but I was there on suicide watch so they could keep an eye on me for observation. Now, you had two cell checks a day with 10 guards that would come in and they weren't messing around. These guards were for punished pr prisoners. They were treating me as a punished prisoner and um, they, they would, you know, if you messed around, raised your hand or whatever, they would, they would get you, they would jump on you. So I had to have my cell spotless. I was coming down off all these drugs and I was just like, what have I done? You know, I was mourning the death of my grandfather and I was just like, you know, my life has got to change. But... I was only in there for one week and I got bailed. I got bailed on home detention, okay? I hadn't learned my lesson yet. That wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for me. I fell back into the drugs, 
back into the gangs, back into the violence. It's a seductive lifestyle and it's all on you, okay? So I'm on home detention, house arrest. If you, I don't know if you know what that means. You've got a bracelet on your ankle, you can't leave the house. And I've got to spend a lot of time there because my court date for my sentencing is years in the future, 18 months. So I was very depressed and I had limited access to drugs. I still could access drugs, but I started to indulge in food. I was eating a lot of food, pork, pork chops for breakfast, oil, cheese, eggs, bacon, getting, I, got, I put on a lot of weight. Got really, really fat. But it was, a, it was all for a reason because this is how the vegan seed got planted for me. So I'm on home, de home detention, still in the gangs, really fat, and, I'm, and I want to lose weight. I just had enough. I hated myself. I wanted to lose the weight. So I was on the internet looking for the best diet to lose weight. And I come across a guy called Dan McDonald, the life regenerator, and he's just a vegan YouTuber who, a raw vegan, and he talks about the life in the fruits and vegetables, and he was doing this juice diet thing. And I was like, oh, I could do that. So I, I got into it, and I, wow, I was drinking these juices, feeling amazing, and I used to watch him every day. And what he said really resonated with me because he, he used to talk about you know, eating dead food and how if you eat death and suffering and that violence, it becomes you. It manifests as disease in your body and you can't eat. It was sort of like that action-reaction thing that I learned when I got hit by the car. You know, I was just like, wow, yeah, we can't eat these suffered animals who've gone through torture and pain and violence and it not affect us. You know, that, that, that just made so much sense to me. So that seed was planted with me and it stayed with me. It stayed with me. Now, not long after that, six months after this seed was planted, I got sentenced. So I spent 18 months on home detention. I got sentenced to prison. This was my prison sentence that I got sentenced to around, I think it was 11 months and I had to serve six months on the bottom. So that means I had to serve six months in jail. And this is where the turnaround happened. This is where the real turnaround happened because this was the longest. I'd never had access to any substances. I, I, like I talk about the environment shaping you, I was pulled out of that environment and I was put into a new environment, okay? And this one was, there was, I was still in my gangs, but there was lots of training in prison and there was no drugs, there's no alcohol. You can get them if you try, but I didn't want to have that light shined on me in prison. I wanted to be respected in there. I didn't want to fall down that track in there. So I stayed, I kept to myself, I kept training. And I seen the people around me, I seen them doing five years, 10 years life, you know, for, for one night doing this, these long stints, and they, don't, they weren't happy, and that place is, it's, it's not a good place. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in there. You don't want to be, a, that's not a place you want to end up. And I had this epiphany, like it was real, like I, I could see everything from a bird's eye view in there. It was so strange, like I had this bizarre awareness. I'd never been sober for 12 years of my life. Since 13, 14, I've been using drugs. I wouldn't have a week off drugs. I was just every day or weekly at least. So I had this sober perspective and I could see that all the mistakes I'd made in my past had led me to there. I could see that. I could see all the, these prisoners around me and I was like, oh, this is no life for me. What am I doing? Like, this is where it ends. And I don't want to be in gangs. Like, being in gangs is, in prison is dangerous. There's opposing gangs and they're bigger and stronger than you and, you, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to you in there. So I, I left prison. Now, when I left prison, I didn't really have the... I wasn't 100% that I was going to stay on track. But there was another thing, another barricade when I got out. It's called parole. Parole, you can't, you, there's no, there's urine testing. So you can't use drugs unless you want to go back in. I didn't want to go back in there. So that was another barricade for me. Now, when I was on um, release the second time, I was having a conversation with my mum. And I was talking to her about smoking because I was sober now. I was like, you know, the epitome of health. And I was like, mum, you know, you should quit smoking. Like, like, I, like I was any, you know, from my past, like, smoking's bad, mum. But like she said to me, um, a lot of people have vices that they don't, you know, change. You know, like there's a lot of people that have things that about them that don't change. And whatever she said, whatever wording she said, it made me reflect. And I think that's very important in changing yourself is reflecting. I looked at my, myself and I was like, well, is there anything that I haven't changed? And I thought to myself, I've always said that I'm going to go vegan. You know, like ever since I, I'd known like that, you know, committing this violence is suffering to these animals was wrong. And I'd seen the hypocrisy once. I was awakened to that seed. I'd seen the hypocrisy in saying you care about animals, you love animals, but you've got a steak on your plate. I was like, save the whales, but you're eating tuna. You know, I, I, I knew that, and I was living with this hypocrisy, but I'd never been sober and had the clarity and sort of courage to change. But that conversation with my mum changed me the next day. I went full vegan, full vegan after that. Now, a little bit later, 
from then after having this awakening, I, I'd, I'd still in the gangs and I went and left the gangs. So that was a, a very significant moment for me. It was a very hard thing to do. Um, when you're in these organised crime groups, um, leaving can be a bit tricky. You know, that people don't want you to leave or, you know, there's a little bit of stuff going on, which there was. There was stuff going on between people and when I left, I was on my own. So anything I'd done in, in the past, I was on my own. I had to deal with it. Any rivalry, I was on my own. I had no one then. I had no one, literally. Like, my family couldn't. Who's going to help me? Like, so it was a very anxious time for me. I was run, riding my bike around by myself, eating bananas, like, wondering what the hell was going to happen to me. You know, just normal vegan stuff. <laughs> but I think this, this is what strengthened me even more, like just, just being by myself, dealing with my emotions, dealing with my anxiety. I was sober. I hadn't dealt with my own emotions without alcohol and drugs for years, you know. Like I, I, was, I was learning to reintegrate. I was learning to communicate with people. I had never had a girlfriend without having a few beers or s some drugs beforehand. I'd never kn known how to deal with my own emotions. And this was like a process. But in this time, this like rebuilding myself, the message of animal rights was galvanizing me. The animal message was calling out to me. And I had this fire, this fire inside of me. And it was like in my chest and I couldn't hold it in. I couldn't hold it in. I was an outspoken vegan. I mean, learning about, I was in, like indulging in all the information. It was like I was hungry for it. I needed to know. I needed to know. I needed to know about, you know, the heart disease risk, the cancer risk, the environmental risk, and what it was actually doing to these poor innocent animals. And I think... I wanted to stick up for these animals. I, I, there's something in, in my heart that said, like, they're, they're so innocent, they're so vulnerable, they've done nothing wrong to us. Why isn't anyone helping them? Okay? Now, this, this fire inside of me, I needed to find a platform to spread it. And there was a few people doing it on YouTube that I respected. And I was like, wow, I could do that. Like, um, my friend Abdullah from the Glucose Network, I don't, I don't know if you've seen him, but I remember he just used to whip out his phone and he used to, like, just say all this stuff. And I was like, I need to do that. I need to do that. The, it was my calling. I had to share my story. I mean, I just pulled myself out of the darkest spot, like you could imagine, like I had a gun in my mouth. I was involved with uh, like a world that you could die, like any you could get killed, you, could, you know, like it was this horrible place. I pulled myself out of that. I had a second chance. I didn't want to waste it. And anyone who's got that fire inside of them, don't deny yourself of that because it will make you depressed. It, it, it will make you depressed if you deny yourself that fire inside of you. So... When you first go vegan, no one cares, do they? <laughs> you think like you think you're gonna start talking to people that are just like, yeah, yeah, mum, mum, listen to this. Animals, environment, your health. You think they're just gonna go vegan like that, but it doesn't work like that. Obviously, you have families the hardest; they don't listen to you, you know. So I thought I'd not bang my head against the wall trying to convince those who didn't want to convince, be convinced. I would go onto, you know, YouTube and do it. YouTube and just tell it to the world and just shine that light and just just try my best. I had to educate myself. So what I, what I say to, to activists is you have to be educated. You have to know what happens to animals. You know, industry practice, you need to be well-versed at. Just, you, and, you know, you don't have to be that well-versed. You just have to know what... You just have to know more than the average non-vegan. That's all you need to know. Just more than them. But I would, my advice would be to, to learn the comebacks. People have the same conditioning. They've been programmed by the same television. You know, um, protein. Iron, calcium, but lions ate meat. Um, you know, we need to, for survival. These all have an answer. So all protein is found in plants first. Where does your protein get their protein? From the grass, okay? So um, iron is found in plants. Every single nutrient is found in the plant kingdom, except for B12, which is found in the dirt and in the water. Um, so learning all these, and w watching the outreach videos really helped. Learning all the, the things to say in response to... to um, people's questions because everyone's got questions. Now, when I first become an activist, I was angry um, I, from the world that I come from. Like I had no way of my my way of dealing with emotion was with aggression. That's that's just how I learned to deal with emotion. I didn't have these skills that normal people build up and like you know like that. So when I first become a vegan activist, I was swearing. I was a bit aggressive. I was angry. I was you know ashamed of myself for what I'd been contributing to. Once I'd in, just sort of engorged myself in all this gory footage and I was just like, you know, I was, felt this urgency to stop people and like that was just the way I dealt with it. But I learned a better way. 
I learned a better way because I'd noticed when I did my street interviews, if anyone hasn't seen my channel, I do street interviews. I've always done street interviews nearly since the start. And I'd noticed that I didn't talk to them when I, like that when I did my street interviews. It was only when I was venting into the camera. Now, vegan activists would like it when I'm venting into the camera because it's like, yeah, go, go get them, Joey, you tell them. <laughs> but that's not my job. My job isn't always to cheer on vegan activists. It's to, you know, be the best advocate for the animals that I can. So am I, am I doing the animals a disservice by turning people away? You know, because Dr. Melanie Joy said something to me that really stuck with me. She said, People don't always remember the content of a conversation, but they remember how it makes them feel. So if they leave you, that conversation, you could have said some really interesting, cool facts about veganism that they could, they could have been educated by. But if you have a bad attitude towards them, if you're aggressive towards them, they're just going to forget all that and just go, I hate vegans. I'm never going to hear the... You know what I'm saying? So our approach is very important. It's like you could be the only vegan they ever, they ever, they ever speak to in their life. And you've got to make that count. So you, gotta, you, have to, you have to respond and not react. It's a very good point. Responding, not reacting. Now, reacting is feeling the emotion and acting, speaking. Responding is feeling the emotion, thinking what, what you think in your head. You can do that, of course, but don't let it come out your mouth. Just wait a second. There's a logical answer for everything. You can argue veganism on logic alone. Carnism is an illogical position, you know? Because there's so many double standards in that. Like, you can stab an animal to death for something as trivial as a sandwich, but if someone stabbed your dog to death, you wouldn't, uh, you know, that would be, that would make you feel uncomfortable. You wouldn't show your children a slaughterhouse, but you'd feed them a bacon sandwich. There's, there's logical ways to argue such a, a clear truth. I mean, it's on the table for it. It's right there. There's the slaughterhouse. It makes you feel sick. That's not food. An apple tree is food, you know? So, so... Being an educated activist helps with that. That's what helps. If you're an uneducated activist, if you don't know, if someone says, oh, well, um, you know, if you eat palm oil, it's cutting down trees, but you don't know that 91% of Amazon deforestation is from animal agriculture, you're going to get frustrated with that. You're going to be like, oh, there's palm oil in my Oreos. He's right. Oh, how do I argue this? Shut up. You know, like, you know, you're going to get angry. But if you know the logical response, you're not going to get angry. You're going to be chill. You're going to be like that. Oh, totally understand. That's a very good point you made there. Yeah, palm oil is an issue. Um, but, you know, did you know 91% of Amazon deforestation is from eating the steak in your sandwich? You know, a lot of people don't know that. And he's going to be like, he's going to be, wow. Or he's going to throw something else at you. Now, what I do is something called Socratic questioning. So Socrates, Greek philosophy, taught people by asking questions. It's basically it. I didn't even know who Socrates was when I first started doing... Uh, Socratic question, it just come naturally to me because it was the least intrusive way of talking to someone about this. So you could go up to someone, you could just be like, boom, you could just be pumping facts into them. That can be overwhelming for people, very overwhelming. But if you, if you ask them a question, like they say, well, it, you know, they look at the cruelty on the screen and they go, yeah, this is just the wrong, the wrong way to do it. This is what people say, okay? I used to say the same thing. It's just not the right way to do it. You know, we, we should be raising them in, in a nice green pasture and it should be a quick death, you know, where they don't feel a thing. This is what I used to think too, free range eggs. I used to think all that stuff. And then you just ask them a question. Do you think there's a humane way to kill someone who doesn't want to die? Okay, simple question. And then you let them talk. Okay, you let them talk. Well, they could either say, yes, there is. Okay, and you could say, okay, was there a humane way to kill your dog? And they could say, no. You can say, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between your dog and the cow? Or if they say, yes, there is a humane way to kill. I said, was there a humane way to kill someone that you love, your family member, or something like that? You've got to find what it is. Some people don't like the human comparison, but you can find it with each person. If, that doesn't, if that's like a little bit of a heated... So you go to, back to the pets. Or, you, you know, you, you got to, it's easy to expose someone's double standard with questions, okay? And every time they answer you, you feed them another question. <coughs> and it feels like they're interacting with you. It makes them think. All right? And when they start thinking, they, they actually see the contradictions themselves. You don't really have to do much. So the way I used to do it, I'd, I'd, I'd set the question up like, so let's just, this is a very simple generalised one, but I'd say like, are you against slavery? <laughs> Who isn't? Who isn't against slavery in their right mind? Okay? And then I could say, oh, you're against slavery? So what about dairy products, consumed dairy products? Yeah, yeah, I love cheese, I love all that stuff. Okay, well, then you could go into the dairy industry with them. You could say, well, you know, these, these cows, they're held against their will, they're forcibly impregnated, they're, they have a nine-month pregnancy, like 
all like us, really, like us. And, you know, when they, their calf is taken, I was in a dairy farm um, a couple of days ago. I don't know if you've seen the video. Horrendous suffering in there. Silence and just suffering. The, the, all the cows have their calves taken away. That's, that's the dairy industry because we want that milk for us, okay? It's, it is the most saddest place to be in a dairy. The, their calves aren't too far away. Okay, they're a stone's throw away from these mothers and they're pining out for their, their children, okay? And they're stuck in these pens, all right? And there's shit everywhere. It's, it's a horrible place to be in. They're all, and they're all getting milk. They're getting milk. They're getting mastitis. There's painful milking machines. There's pus going into the milk. And they're only, some of them are only like a year old. They've already had a pregnancy, had the cow. These are only children that are having their children taken away, you know? Horrendous suffering and slavery. It's, it's the, it, the, the dairy industry is the slave trade. Okay, so... You've established they don't, they, they don't agree with slavery. You've established they eat dairy products. You've explained the dairy industry to them. And you could say, do you think that supporting the dairy industry is like supporting slavery? And you've, you've, you've sort of, you've asked them a question. They've answered it. They've already said they're against it. And then you've sort of made a point, a very strong point, that dairy industry is animal slavery. You know, so that's the way I, I approach it. Um, there's many other different ways, but asking questions is so much more effective than pumping information. But do both. Do both. So with outreach, what I like to do is very similar thing, very similar thing, except I build, I build rapport with who I'm talking to. Okay, so I don't talk to like, a, like I wouldn't talk to some 14 year old kids the same way that I talk to a mother of four. You know, like, you, you, you know, there's, there's a way you talk to certain people and I know that it's just general social skills, you, you, but you can read people. You can read people and like, you know, sometimes if you're a bloke and you've got some, you know, younger dude there, 17 year olds, like, what's going on bro? Like, do you think this is all right? It's pretty, Pretty messed up, eh? But like, you talk to them like on their level. So you do outreach, you know. You, you, you know, like you be respectful to, you know, if it's an older lady, you be respectful. You talk, you know, how and talk politely and calmly, and you know, you know. Sometimes you can make it about health and how it would sustain their life longer. Things like that. Building rapport is important when talking to people about veganism. And this is you got to be feely. You got to feel the conversation where it's going. Okay. Um, you can see with people if they're an emotional person, you can go with ethics, okay, they're emotional, you know. You know that they care about animals, okay? You, you, what you're trying to do is sell veganism to this person so that they stop contributing to the cruelty and violence in their life. That's, that's our goal, okay? Um, so, the, so with AV, we show slaughterhouse footage. Um, the thing with showing slaughterhouse footage is it can get people caught up on treatment so that people go, well... They're just treating the animals badly in that scenario. The way that we tackled this is saying this is England, this is you know local slaughterhouse footage, labelling where the slaughterhouse footage is. It becomes the rule, not the exception, but people still will say, no, 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 I don't get my meat from there. I get mine from a fairy tale, free range farm. You know, that's where I get mine from. It doesn't get treated like that. So that's cool. That's cool. If showing them slaughterhouse footage leads the conversa conversation to humane slaughter, that's where it ends anyway. That's where it all, it, it all ends. The conversation ends at humane slaughter. That's where you want it to head. Because then you've got the question, is there a humane way to kill an animal that doesn't want to die? Okay? And they're an animal, so they should be able to empathise with that position. No, there's not. Because otherwise, you wouldn't get charged with murder for walking up behind someone and shooting them in the back of their head and they didn't feel a thing. They had a happy life. They were free range. You know what I'm saying? So that's where the conversation should go to on outreach when you're showing... Uh, sometimes it doesn't. It goes somewhere else, but... You know, if it goes there, it's good, good for you anyway. Like, obviously, there's people that don't want to listen. Now, you have to be the best judge of that. You do, like, if you're banging your head against the wall with one person for half an hour and you see that it's not going anywhere, then you should have cut it off 15 minutes ago because there's probably someone waiting at the screens or there's probably someone who's really interested in, in, in hearing the message. Now, someone like me, if I'm going to have a 20-minute debate with someone, I'm filming it, okay? I'm filming it. So it's going to go on YouTube. People are going to get something out of it. But if you're just a one-on-one -on -one outreacher and you're spending 25 minutes, wow, oh, oh, this guy, he's not listening. Like, and you can tell. They're just like, yeah, whatever. Like, you, know, you can tell by their attitude. They're, they're not being intellectually honest. They're lying to you about certain things. Like, yeah, I wouldn't care if someone killed me. No, 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 you, no, no I don't care. Like, you, you know, then you know that that's, that's, it's probably best for you as an outreacher to move on to the next person and say, but in a most polite way, Always be polite. Never be disrespectful. Even if they're being disrespectful you do, to you, don't. Just don't play their game. They're looking for any excuse just because you're vegan, just because you're sticking up for animals. They'll just be like, oh, this vegan, you know. But don't give them a reason. Just be polite. Thank you very much. Thanks for the conversation. 
You want to take a card? If not, then see you later. Having cards on you is... I can't tell you how much it's helped my activism. I've got some printed out. I'll, I can hand them out to you after and you can have a look. But it's just got ethics, environment, health. A few links don't overwhelm people with information. Health and environment's easy. Cowspiracy and what the hell. Ethics, uh, do here, do Land of Hope and Glory. I, I put Gary's, Yurovsky's speech. You can put James Aspie's if you're not into Gary's approach. And I put Darius Scary. Something about eggs. Okay, that's, that's enough. And have them in your pocket. Have on the back um, Challenge 22. That's, the, that's what I would recommend. Because Challenge 22 gives them a mentor. Gives them registered dietitians. They... You know, if you want to be a mentor on Challenge 22, get in touch with them too. But Challenge 22 is the best place to send people, I feel like. So have all this, the information on the front, have Challenge 22 on the back, keep them in your pocket, keep them in your bum bag, in your backpack. You know, like, and when you're talking to someone about veganism, anyone, you can just go, hey, take a card. You know who's receptive, hey, take a card. And when people ask you what you do, say, oh, yeah, I work here, but I'm also an animal rights activist, and it brings up the conversation, you can go, here, take a card. Boom, boom, boom. And that's, it's just so good, man. It's so good. You're just planting seeds everywhere, bang, bang, bang. And always have something on outreach to hand to people after you talk to them. So, vegan activism. So, a lot of vegans think because they're vegan, that's enough. I don't think so. I think that's just that's the least we can do. Being like, it's just like saying like walking around not punching people is a good thing to do. Like, you know, you should pat me on the back. I don't walk out and punch anyone today. You know, like that's just being impartial. That's being neutral. You know, it's like being some piece of coral that doesn't hurt anyone, okay? Vegan activism is what stops the violence. So, and, and there's a lot of different ideas about what vegan activism is. So just because we're out there stopping our slaughterhouse trucks and, you know, d you know getting in these debates on the streets, holding signs, that, that, that is activism. That is one form of activism. There's many forms of activism, and it's about being proactive and utilising your skills in whatever you know, avenue that is. It might, it might be, look at this cafe. Heaps of vegan options. It's, it's, it's beautiful. That, that, that is activism. And look on the walls here, like this. Vegan hairdressers. You could be doing someone's hair, like you've got all vegan products. You could talk about the vegan products and why they're cruelty-free. And, you know, you could be doing outreach with this person and sending them off on their way. Amazing activism. Um, recipes, uh, recipe videos. Uh, there's heaps of different ways to do activism. The veganic gardening, gardening that I was talking to old mate over here before. That stuff there, like, there's many different ways we need to utilise all different approaches. Not everyone's going to be a YouTuber out there doing debates, you know, like, find what you're good at. It might be organising activist events. Laura here helps me with organising and writing emails and sorting through my emails. I can't do that. I just can't, but it helps me out a lot. So, if we don't speak up for the animals, no one else is going to. Vegans need to. Like, it's, it's basically, like, vegetarians aren't going to. You know, there's people that stick up for, you know, maybe a certain, you know, sort of a single issue sort of thing with animals. They might say, oh, dog cruelty is wrong. That's fine. That's amazing. That's good. But vegans are, only, vegans are going to take care of the bulk of the problem, which is the meat, dairy and egg industries, which are killing trillions, trillions of animals. There's not even a number. Like, like we could try to talk about numbers. It's like, you know, 60 billion land animals and two to three trillion marine animals every year. Like they have to measure marine animals in tons. Like, this is happening every second. Every second, tortured, violence, you know, it's a bloodbath, and it, we don't really have to get into what you all know. Most, mostly everyone here is vegan, so. But if we don't do it, no one else is going to do, do it. So if the animals could save themselves, they would save themselves. Okay, so just think of that. You know, it's up to us. It's up to us. So just everyone doing their part and coming together collectively. And our job isn't to turn everyone vegan. Our job is to plant seeds, okay? So don't get bent out of shape if you didn't turn vegan on the spot. I didn't turn vegan on the spot. Someone said one thing to me. If you eat violence and suffering and death and torture, it becomes you. Someone said that to me. Now, six months later, I made the change. You could say one thing to someone and they could ponder that. They could just be pondering it. You know, don't get like, oh, you should go vegan now. No, no, no. They're thinking about it. They're thinking about it. Ask them a question that they, God, it's a hard one to answer. And they leave you. You don't know what's going to happen to them. Otherwise, they, they, they could be walking around with this guilt for the rest of their life. And, then, and, and one time when the environment's right and inside of them and the conditions are right, boom, that seed flourishes, they go vegan. So our job is to be like gardeners, plant seeds wherever we go, um, be respectful and peaceful, educational, patient. These things are what make a, a good vegan advocate from what have made me a good vegan advocate. I mean, that's what I've had the best results from. I'm getting messages all the time, turn me vegan, turn me into activist. The best ones 
I really like are the ones, oh, you helped me become a vegan activist. And if you get up, there's something called the standby effect, where like, there's a car accident, right? And there's like, a bunch of people that are standing there watching, they're just in shock. Oh my God, it's a car accident. Oh my God. One person runs up and helps that person in the car. Then the next person runs up, and then they all see it, and they all run up. Okay, it's the standby effect. So you be that one that runs up. All right? Everyone here, be that, that person that runs up. Courage, I like to say something about courage. Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Um, courage isn't something you're just born with. It's not something that you're just given. It's something that comes from gradually stepping out of, outside of your comfort zone. So whatever that comfort zone might be. You might have a really tight, closed comfort zone and stepping out of that might just be talking to someone about it. You know, might, you might have a little bit more relaxed comfort zone. You might, might want to do something a little bit more full on, you know, get, get out there and interact and, you know, pump them in. You might want to get on YouTube, you know. Get, that might be stepping out of your comfort zone. There's many ways to step out of your comfort zone, but we should always be pushing to do a little bit more, you know, and, and, and you'll find that you feel so fulfilled, so liberated like that when you step outside your com comfort zone. So... Courage is something you cultivate. It's not something you're just given. It's something you have to work on and push towards and just step by step. Don't be overwhelmed. It's like, like bake some vegan cakes, bring them, talk, talk, leave a little dairy pamphlet or something. You know, just all of us working together is what creates a movement. You might change one person for the rest of their life and they might become the next greatest vegan activist just from something you said to them, just from one thing you said to them. And that happens all the time. So look at James Aspie. Someone said one thing to him. Now he's an amazing activist. And, you know, I was in Israel recently. Israel, we had the biggest animal rights march ever. Ever. I mean, a little a week earlier, we were in London marching together. It was amazing. So there's marches happening all over the world, and the biggest ever, like, standing in front, you didn't really realise, you, you just couldn't hear them. And then when I seen the photo and I ran back there, thousands, thousands and thousands, and it's just a sea, a sea of people standing up for animals. So this is happening, this movement is happening. So if you're ever losing hope, if you ever think, oh, it's hopeless, you know, we've got no hope and the violence and the suffering just overwhelms you and you're just like, there's no, not enough people doing this. Or like This movement, since I've been vegan nearly four years, this movement has grown exponentially. So at the start, it's just like this little, you know, trick, like, it's like a cell multiplying. Yeah, yeah, and that's happening really slow, painfully slow. Now it's starting to pick up. All right, and it's a snowball effect. And what we've seen in the last two years, the last two years, activists emerging. People are going vegan, like, on record. Countries are marching. We're marching through the streets. They're shutting down the streets. All right, so that what we are doing is working, and they have to listen because no injustice can last forever. It, it just can't. Injustice can last a long time, a very long time, but it can't last forever. Slavery, women's rights, gay rights, these things... They are, they are God-given rights. They're, 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 they're things that we are born with in, you know, and that we deserve. And that these are, just like human rights are important, animal rights will come up as being just as important. And it's only due to activists that are going to make that happen. So, and we're all in this together, so you're not alone. Remember, we, we're all in solidarity together as a movement. We should all be supporting each other. You, know, you might not agree with someone's activism. You might say, oh, you know, as long as their activism isn't hurting animals, isn't like, you know, telling people, yeah, yeah, you can hurt animals in this situation, but, you know, if they're doing vegan activism, like, who, do, who am I to say their approach is terrible? No, no, don't do that. Like, I don't know. I don't know what works for some people, what might not work for others. So we should all be supporting each other. As long as they're in it for the animals, we need to be supporting that, you know. You might, you, you might want to do it your way, though. Like, I like to do it my way. I don't like to be aggressive and, you know, I don't think that works for me. But who am I to say that, you know, these activists that are out there being aggressive isn't getting through to some, someone out there. So you're not alone. We're all in this together. That's a very important point to make. So I know it can feel like that, but we're not. And I like to leave all my talks with this quote. Um, it's about a lion. The truth is like a lion, all right? It needs no one to defend it. You set the truth free and it will defend itself, okay? So you've got the truth on your side. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.